Hello and welcome to uh, this webinar organized by Financial News Custom Studio and the Six Exchange. My name is Francesco Guerrera. I am the publisher of Financial News and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, it is my pleasure to host uh, this with a great panel. Over the next uh, uh, 45 minutes to an hour, we'll go through the ins and outs of ICOs and many other uh, ways of raising money through tokenization. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the first of a, a four-part series on the future of exchanges. We are hosting with Six uh, Exchange and Six Group, and we're very proud to be partnering with them. So without further ado, I will introduce the panelists. Uh, and please re uh, a reminder that you can ask questions uh, through, your, uh, through your console to uh, just the Q&A button. And we will um, ask them dur during the, uh, the, the panel and towards the end. So feel free to ask at any point uh, and specify who you want to answer the question. So without further ado, I'll introduce you to, to our panel. Uh, uh, we have uh, live uh, from the East Coast of the United States, uh, Melta Demiros, who is the Chief uh, Strategy Officer for CoinShares. Melta, thanks so much for being with us, especially because it's very, very early there. So thank you, especially to you. Uh, we also have, <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, we also have uh, Rupertus Rotenhauser, uh, who is the uh, Chief Clients and Products Officer and member of the Management Board at Six Digital Exchange. He joins us from Germany. Uh, and last but not least, Shobit Maini, Director of Markets and Security Services at City. Uh, he joins us from London. So we have two of us from London, uh, one continental, from continental Europe and one from the US. It's a very international panel. So I'm going to start directly with the, uh, if you like, the elephant in the room here. So can ICOs recover reputationally and otherwise from the fact that they were really misused during the 2017 boom? Can we see more companies and more exchanges adopting ICOs, given what happened in the past couple of years? I would like to start with you, Melton, because you have a direct experience on many of these sure. issues. Of course. Um, so look, when I started in the cryptocurrency market, I come from the commodities world and the corporate M&A world. When I started in cryptocurrencies in 2015 professionally, there was one cryptocurrency and it was called Bitcoin. That was it. Um, in 2015, we saw the introduction of Ethereum, the network launched in 2016. And then in 2017, using the flexibility and composability that Ethereum introduced, we saw the launch of the first wave of tokens um, on Ethereum. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is ICOs actually existed before Ethereum. Um, the initial ICOs of 2013, 2014 are things that probably only us um, old school Bitcoiners remember. But really in 2017, what we saw is this massive rush of people who wanted to um, raise capital in new and innovative ways. I actually contemplated wearing this sweatshirt that I have that says venture capital is dead. Um, I had it made for a, a conference that I went to in Munich. And I wore it on stage with um, Albert Wenger, who's um, a VC at U Union Square Ventures. But we had this long debate. Look, a lot of people thought ICOs were an innovative way to raise capital. And what happened as a result, there were two fundamental innovations. One was the ability to tokenize anything using the ERC-20 standard. I think of it almost as like the AWS wave, um, what that did for creating software products. I think about tokens in the same way of what it did for capital raising. It really introduced the idea of um, being able to raise capital in this new, really efficient way. <clears throat> Pardon. And then the second component that's really important that we can't forget is the financing component. So for the first time, you could finance an investment purely in cryptocurrencies. So you didn't need an M&A bank. You didn't need a broker dealer to escrow or hold funds. You didn't need a lot of the counterparties that would typically be involved in a capital raising transaction. So you have the tokenization component that was abstracted into software. It was open source software that anyone could utilize. And then you had the ability to take in capital or all of the functions of the the capital raising side of the market that were also abstracted because of this ability to raise crypto assets directly via a contract. And so these two things together created this influx of, of ICOs. And while I think what happened during 2017, 2018 was not necessarily a positive outcome, um, what I do think is many of the ideas that were explored and pioneered during that time really opened people's eyes to what's possible once you digitize and tokenize an asset. And really the fundamental innovation here, um, look, we have digitization in markets already. Most of us who trade on any market, we're trading disintermediated share certificates. We're not trading paper 
paper share certificates. So the innovation isn't just the component of disintermediation, uh, dematerialization, and digitization. The, the innovation, in my view, is really once something becomes a blockchain-based asset, it has the, these unique features. Uh, the first feature it has that's really unique is it has settlement finality, meaning if I transfer it from one uh, wallet to another, it settles with finality without needing an intermediary like a settlement agent or clearing house. Um, all of a sudden, what I'm able to do is I'm able to abstract out these vertically integrated platforms where typically I'd have price discovery and execution at the market level. I'd have a clearing house if it's centrally cleared, or I'd have bilateral clearing arrangements if it's not, and then I'd have settlement through some sort of regulated custodian. What we've now been able to do is abstract all of those layers from being regulated intermediaries into being software. And that sounds crazy, but I believe that software is eating capital markets and will continue to eat capital markets. Doesn't mean banks and intermediaries are going away. It just means their role and their, their function in the capital raising process will, will change. Um, the last thing I'll say before I pass it off <clears throat> to others is the other interesting thing that really emerged from the ICO boom was the importance of two things. Uh, the first is exchangeability. So for many ICOs and for many tokens that were launched in a 2017-2018 sort of era, the primary goal was to obtain an exchange listing. And that was about facilitating a secondary marketplace for these assets. And I think we see the same challenges that a lot of people are trying to address today is the issue of exchangeability and really price discovery is what we're talking about here. And the second component that I think we also learned in 2018 when the market started to crater and all assets started to fall in price is the importance of liquidity and the fundamental difference between exchangeability and liquidity or market depth. Um, and I think both of those topics are going to be really interesting in our discussion today. And I think what we're learning in the digital security space are this new evolution where we're applying a lot of um, constructs we already have in regulated capital markets, but moving them to digitized form on a blockchain that has these unique features and enabling them to be financed by stable coins or digital representations of, of fiat currencies. I think we're learning the same things without all of that infrastructure structure to support price discovery, efficient execution, clearing through a counterparty and settlement with an institutional custodian, you still have many of those same challenges that we, we discovered firsthand in 2018 with the sort of first big wave of ICOs. Excellent. So that's a great segue to go into reporters who is from the regulated capital markets. He runs a regulated capital market. Uh, What's your perspective on this? Can you really uh, can you really catch on to the level that Meltem uh, predicts? And so, with extensibility, also comes liquidity, price discovery, and everything else the software allows you to do. Well, um, first of all, we are on route to become a regulated exchange. We are not quite there yet. Um, we have submitted um, our first batch to FINMA for license filing in end of last year, and we are just about to send our second batch. Um, SDX is looking and progressing in a different format. We don't even use the word ICO anymore because we don't like it. We believe ICOs was a, a, a flavor of the season. I think a lot of money has been burned. A lot of private individuals have burned a lot of money. Um, it is a cool concept, though, um, using new technology, enabling financing uh, in, a, in, a, in a disruptive way, um, enabling participants to do their own decision of choice um, has a its, has its, has meaningful sense. But we believe it cannot be done in an unregulated way, full point. I mean, people will always be left over, run over by some smart guys and a hell of a lot of not so smart guys. In order to democratize uh, and harmonize this market model, it has to be in cooperation with the regulator. So we have decided at six levels, six exchanges is our mother, six exchanges the sponsor of the SDX project, even though we are a, 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 an independent corporate with our own governance and our own organization building uh, stuff, uh, we, of course, belong 100% to six, and six is, uh, is, is, is taking very much close look on what we do. And as a mother, being the regulated stock exchange in Switzerland, you cannot simply grant your daughter 
complete freedom and disruptive business, whatever you want. Six is owned by the financial industry of Switzerland, mainly the Swiss banks, who they want to use the X as their arm's length enabler and developer of tech stack who enables those banks in the second step to use us as a financial market infrastructure. Since we are independent, we need to we need to build our own and, and get granted our own licenses. So we have applied for a stock exchange license for digital assets, and we apply for a CSD license for digital assets because we believe the market infrastructure model enabling an issuance of security tokens, trading, settlement of security tokens, finality in the in the transaction, plus the custody and the asset servicing on DLT is something completely new. We have the uh, great advantage that we live in, an, in a jurisdiction in Switzerland and operate in a jurisdiction which has a, a digital asset friendly regulator. It's not a coincidence that many, many franchises and businesses are centralized in their business either in Zug or in Geneva or in Crypto Valley or in, in Zurich because the Swiss umbrella for FINMA regulatory topics is quite digital asset friendly. Financial markets as such is an extremely important financial economy factor in Switzerland. So that's an initial drive by the government and the, and the regulator in supporting new initiatives. They want to be at the forefront of any of these developments. And finally, we have a digital asset and digital exchange currency friendly central bank because we are going to offer a model where SDX enables and allows member firms who must be um, licensed Swiss financial intermediaries. So we can, you have to either own a Swiss banking license or you must be a Swiss licensed broker dealer in order to become an SDX member. So it's a pure B2B play. We enable our member firms to offer their clients new market access, new asset classes, uh, efficiency gains, issuance efficiency, operational risk reduction. They want to trial and error with us. What does it bring me if I put my business on DLT? Do I reduce risk? Am I faster? Do I use less capital in order to finance my business? So all of these factors play an important role. Um, and I guess we're going to come into, into, into finality and the settlement issues and digital currency in order to do the atomic trade and settlement in a second. But I guess that's, that's, that should be for, the, for my intro. So, yeah, so a uh, quick question before I move to Shubit. So if you don't use the word ICO, what do you use? What, what kind of, we use what do you use? Security token. We use security tokens. We, I believe uh, ICO, uh, we don't use it. STO, security tokens. The word ICO is, is what, what is a coin? We don't believe in coins. We believe in security tokens, you have utility tokens, you have security tokens, and they are actually governed and explored by the regulator. And they, what has each of, the secu each of the token characteristics differentiate a requirement for being licensed or not. If you have a utility coin that gives you kind of benefits, if you do something and you get a token, that's not regulated. If you are using security tokens, which is in fact the representative of a security, is a pure security, and this only exists in Swiss law, um, that is equal to securities. It's just the digital version. Instead of issuing a bond, printing the certificate, deposit the certificate on the CSD, so there is always the physical paper connected to the asset. On digital assets, and especially on security tokens, this is digital this is a call a book entry within 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 the chain that has the same rights and deliveries as you would issue an old style security okay um so should be um quick question for you arising from what the other two were saying so uh it's obvious that the regulation has to play a part here i mean is there a question of investor suitability here as well so even within the regular markets some investors shouldn't really be playing with this stuff or What's your sense? Sure, sure. I mean, when, when we look at any new product or any new technology, right, we always look look at it from the eyes of our customers, right, and what they are thinking and who are our customers. I mean, our customers are some of the largest corporates in the world, some of the government's public sector clients, some of the largest pension funds and hedge funds around the world, right? And when we speak to them, I mean, their concerns are pretty much similar to ours 
uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, dealing in instruments and counterparties that are regulated and that are underpinned by solid uh, risk and operational management frameworks so in that uh, in that uh, if you think about it right these these clients and these market participants have their own franchise risk to manage so uh, i do think i do think uh, that the next iteration that we would be see we would see it around some we would see it around something that's blessed by the regulators so it gets all not not only us but our other counterparties and peers and financial market infrastructures players comfortable with the regulatory aspect of it having said that i mean 2020 is very different from 2017 regulators have taken an active interest in this space and they continue to engage with market participants they have uh, and and they de- they deeply want to understand and and address this side of the market but where we i mean at this point of time where we see really values right with assets on blockchain is you can have significant efficiency gains i mean looking from the perspective of our issuer clients right uh, and a, a, a client that's looking to issue debt or equity is that you can you can bring in significant amount of efficiency gains and and not only in corporate actions or dividends coupon payments but also also from a perspective of our investor clients there are in efficiency gains from the perspective of uh, asset servicing so so the the way we think we the way we think about it and that's where we focused our efforts on i mean the first wave of uh, work or innovation that we will see in this space would be around post trade efficiency gains and moving on to blockchain assets that are issued on blockchain but that there this but but as everyone knows right blockchain is not is a team sport right it's no party can do it unilaterally uh, so and and that's the, that's the hard that's the hard bit getting multiple parties to work together and uh, and and that takes time that takes time and there's multiple ducks that need to get in a row ranging from having a very resilient infrastructure to support these assets which which is something which was arguably missing in 2017 uh having 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 market participants with balance sheets that can support bilateral credit agreements uh and 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 that and that will be the key driver and that and given the history of other asset classes what we've seen and these things just take time it's it's so so what we continue to work on we continue to work on uh, our initiatives and i mean one of the things that we we at city are very particular about is we we do not want to work on something for the sake of it because we think that technology is not the solution in itself technology is a part of the solution so which and the other components of the solution being your strong operational credit risk market risk frameworks and legal and regulatory compliance uh now technology can definitely help to scale the solutions but it's not the complete solution in itself so where we focused is making sure that uh, to the extent possible making sure that the things that we are working on are, is just not working for the sake of proof of concepts but also something that we can scale and offer in the market and one of the examples of that is something that we announced uh, earlier this year is uh, equity swaps over uh, over blockchain which we worked with one of our peer banks and which was built in uh, which was built with uh, with inputs from 15 other market participants including buy side and sell side so uh, this is a good point to go back to melton then because you said melton that software is eating capital markets but it seems like capital markets are fighting back right so so if everything is going to be regulated and you know stos you have to issue prospectus and you have to have banks and intermediaries then the efficiency gains will get eroded right it seems very much like a usual ipo just a little more techy 
Okay, well, I, I, I want to touch on something that I think is really important and doesn't get talked about enough. Just because an offering is regulated does not confer quality on the offering. There seems to be a lot of confusion, and a lot of confusion is in the messaging, where people attempt to use regulation or the fact that something is issued under ex an existing regulatory framework. I think Reg D in the United States is the most popular one um, currently. That does not confer quality. Thousands of companies that launch every year are terrible investments, right? These are private capital markets are high risk investments. I run our venture investing strategy at CoinShares. This is a high risk strategy. Um, so I think there is this misnomer where people believe just because something is regulated that confers quality, it does not. And look, all you have to do is look at what's happening in the market we're living in right now. Right, All of these companies that had really high credit ratings, all of these companies that were market darlings have had terrible management practices, are heavily over levered. There are a bunch of systemic issues. Just because something's regulated, just because something has a stamp or seal of approval on it, does not mean that it is somehow a, a better investment. It simply means that more diligence has been done and more transparency and information is there to allow participants in that market to make more informed decisions. So I just want to kind of disclaim that because I do think, um, especially when we talk to people in legacy markets, we are an asset manager and financial services firm. We've been operating for seven years. Our uh, tracker products are traded on the NASDAQ throughout Europe. I run our FINRA regulated broker dealer in the United States. Um, we register all of our investment vehicles um, in the private market with the SEC under all of the relevant regulations and requirements. We deal in a number of different jurisdictions. There is this idea that I think has been popularized on in certain news publications and in certain parts of the financial services ecosystem that crypto markets are the wild west or that they are unregulated. And I think that is um, simply untrue in many instances. There are parts of the market that are not yet as formalized. For example, um, if we're talking about the, the options market, right? The crypto derivatives and options market is a $3 trillion market. It's almost as big, by the way, as uh, parts of the legacy market. The exchange in the space that provides um, the most widely utilized options contract, BitMEX, they, um, on most trading days, are the fourth or fifth biggest exchange in the world by trading volume. Not in crypto, just all markets, right? Yeah. So this is a big market. There's a lot of interest. There are a lot of people trading in this market. And a lot of the standards that we see in other markets simply haven't developed in this market. There is no central clearinghouse. There is no ISDA equivalent that's um, developing standard contracts. One of the issues that we're dealing with is um, the lack of standardization, right? And as I mentioned earlier, what the ERC-20 standard did for tokens is it created exactly that. It created a template, it created a standard, and it provided um, formalization around an, an idea. And once you have formalization and a standard, then you can start to build compatible market infrastructure. What's interesting now is what we've learned in cryptocurrency markets that I think is starting to seep into other markets is, um, you know, there are a lot of contracts in the legacy market that people are interested in putting on a blockchain um, and enabling some of the attributes that you have in, in crypto markets 24-7 open markets, right? Um, you have the ability to use anything as collateral. In fact, in the crypto lending market, there are a lot of really unique attributes to how you use um, assets as collateral because you over collateralize. So you reduce a lot of the systemic risks in the event of a, a downturn. In fact, in the recent events we saw where we saw uh, the price of Bitcoin drop by 50%, there were no significant issues in the lending market because everyone was over collateralized by 30 to 50%. So when they got close to margin, you know, they can margin call at 2 a.m. on a Sunday and people will have to post collateral and if not, they can liquidate. So there are all these really inherently unique attributes you get. But I think one thing that people forget is one of the really unique features as well is all of a sudden you don't need standard contracts anymore. Um, one of the really cool properties you have when you start to abstract capital markets infrastructure into software as opposed to relying on venues like the CME to provide you with a standardized format for the contract is you take markets that have historically been bespoke dealer to dealer or broker to broker markets or markets that have suffered from a lack of liquidity or a difficult post-trade settlement process or a, post, uh, a difficult bilateral clearing and settlement process, what you start to get is the ability to turn um, execution and to turn a contract into 
programmatic software that self-executes and to tie assets to it. And I think that's a really unique attribute that we can't underestimate. And at the end of the day, what's going to drive people to this market is the efficiency they see, but also the capabilities of this new market that you just don't see in legacy markets. So I think you can fight it. I think you can you know, call it the Wild West. I think I've spent a lot of time with regulators who have very interesting perceptions about what digital currencies are, how they function. But our ecosystem, um, it self-regulates. People have reputations. There are certain counterparties we deal with, certain counterparties we don't. I think, again, there is this sort of fear that's been created in people's minds when you even say the word crypto that I think is a bit misplaced because uh, this market is maturing. It's maturing very quickly. And we're talking about a lot of um, counterparties in these markets. We're talking about a lot of contracts that are being traded. And we're talking about really highly scalable trading platforms that are developing that are being utilized to build some of the largest markets in the world. So I am really bullish about coins. I do think cryptocurrencies have a fundamental role to play, particularly in the role of infinite QE that we're experiencing right now. Um, so I wouldn't dismiss coins all together. <laughs> I do think they have a fundamental role to play in the story that's going to unfold in the next 10 to 20 years. That's great. So uh, Rupert, if I can ask you, so I think Meltem uh, lists some of the advantages of this beat ICO STOs. What, what else? I mean, yeah. how do you sell it to an issuer or even to an investor? I mean, what, what, what are the advantages? And, and in particular, I would like to ask you about liquidity, because that's going to be a crucial uh, test, if you like, of this, uh, of this, new, uh, th this new ways of raising money. So how do you ensure Absolutely. liquidity? How can you foster liquidity? Well, first of all, as I said, we are in the process of building the platform. So by, by, uh, by summer this year, we will um, have our what we call alpha release, which is the technology stack that, that enables market participants to connect and trial and test the platform. Uh, by the end of the year, we believe this is going to lead into what we call the MVP. That's the product we're going to go live with. And then it needs the FINMA license rubber stamp on the paper that kicks us off into the into go live. But what do we do offer here? Well, first of all, I love the word standardization because that's what we do. Every bank, believe me, I have seen every financial institution of size and, and, and matter in the last 18 months. I figure out which one of them has a strategy on digital assets, which one has a strategy on digital transformation of the platform. This is not about Bitcoin here. This is about changing the core infrastructure of financial institutions over the next 10 to 20 years. This is, we are now the Netscape navigator and we want to be in the internet of things in 20 years from now. That's basically the jump we want to, want to achieve here. So what we do is, is standardization. The banks and financial institutions I'm, ta I'm talking to, they must have a valuable position. What brings this for them? It's not, it's not a tech play. I mean, if they want to play tech, they did play tech. BNP, Sockchain, UBS, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, you name them, all of them have done tremendous amounts of tests on POCs. They are fed up with POCs because what it normally means is a bank, investment bank issues a digital bond, transfers it on an ERC-20 protocol to the buy side. They place it with an institution, an investor, deal, sign, forget, take the box. There is no business behind it. You cannot use, every bank cannot use its proprietary model to create a market. We are the infrastructure provider who have the ambition to create that market. And that's why we decided to use a permission protocol. We're using R3 Corda as our blockchain provider. They are the ones who develop the soft that enables the participants on the platform under a synchronized standardization format issuing tokens, trade them, execute them, pay them, and store them. That's the model. So instead of creating, testing, and throw it in the bin, we want to keep it alive. We want to create a marketplace where exactly those member firms can do what I've just described, including using the Swiss Digital Franc in order to pay the transaction, because I like it when, when Melton says the settlement finality is the one of the core advantages of this technology. The moment you trade a token against a currency, it's traded, it's settled, it's finalized, it's out, it's forgotten. There is no counterparty risk, there is no settlement default risk, everything happens 
on the fly, as we call it, atomic trading and settlement. So this is the this is the value proposition. So all my participant banks who I'm talking to, they need to connect to the platform and they can identify for themselves. Do I want to do a standardization on a debt process or product, or do I want to test a SME equity uh, funding in, uh, exercise? And I agree with Malcolm. There are millions of bad investments, millions of bad investments. And this and technology does not make a difference between a good and a bad investment. But in order to to create something that is standardization in terms of where does the money come from? Who has done the KYC process? Where do the funds come from? Who is the ultimate beneficial owner? You can only operate in a permission chain. None of the big banks, none of the regulators will approve a, a standardization financial market infrastructure without answering those questions. We do not want to enter into the battle of becoming a bank in order to do KYC processing. Onboarding clients, B2C, is not our business because we, first of all, we would not be willing to compete with our owners. It's their business, it's not our business. We enable them in order to do additional business for their clients. We are simply an infrastructure provider. But KYC would be important thing. Wallet transfer, wallet opening, key account management is not our cup of tea. We do it for the financial institutions using us, but we would never do it in order to fulfill a service for private individuals. That's one thing. The second thing is on cryptos. It has changed tremendously over the last 18 months. When I started in SDX in July 2018, when the company was founded, if you would have used the word cryptos, they would have thrown stones at you. Suddenly, the banks come to me and say, Look, are you guys doing kind of custody services for cryptos? Suddenly, people in my private banking come to me and says, look, I have my USB stick here, and there's a lot of crypto on it, and I don't want to carry my USB stick with me. Do you provide safer services in order to store my assets? Yes. They suddenly it comes, and I'm fully with Melton. This is an ongoing business. I don't think you can neglect it. It's an ongoing business, and whatever works for cryptos should work for digital assets as securities. Uh, one likes bonds, one likes equity, the next one wants to tokenize a commercial piece of property. Wherever the issuance process is complex, the price discovery is hard, and the transfer of ownership, even in fractional pieces on chain, is difficult. That's where this technology helps. We don't bring value in a high frequency trading on equity and futures. That works perfect. We would not even touch it. But areas where the th one of the three elements is not working perfect, that's where we come into play. So I, I want to uh, ask uh, Shobit about this because, as you said, you need the financial intermediaries to take part in this uh, in order for this to function. Uh, in the meantime, though, I want to remind everybody uh, on the live webcast that they can ask questions. I've seen a couple of good questions. We'll get to them uh, in, a, in a little while. So keep asking questions. We, we'll record them all and then we'll put it to, to the panel, uh, who, as you can see, is very uh, well, well, well versed in answering them. So uh, now, uh, Shobit, so Rupert has made a very uh, passionate case for this. Um, do you buy into it? So as a financial institution, do you want to take part in this? I mean, because without you guys, it looks like it's not going to happen. So, I mean, as things stand now, right, with public blockchains, right, I mean, and com just purely speaking from as th things stand now with them, uh, we believe that public blockchains cannot scale up to meet the requirements that financial institutions require. I mean, I mean, we have privacy concerns right now because every transaction is visible. I mean, obviously, there are solutions being worked out on it, but they're not there yet. Uh, the transaction capacity is uh, limited. Uh, and also, there are resiliency issues, right? I mean, as we saw more recently during the recent uh, market sell-off that, I mean, the block, block times were long, much longer than uh, what they are expected to be, and I mean, working in a regulated environment, and obviously, where when our clients are relying us to support them uh, in these times, we need to be we need to be working on infrastructure that is fairly resilient. I mean, so public blockchains are not there yet. Doesn't mean they will not be there in the future. But as things stand now, uh, public blockchains are not fit for purpose. Uh, Having said that, I mean, but I mean, on, on the flip side, 
I mean, if you think in a macro perspective, uh, what uh, with with and, and this is this is just me 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 thinking it uh, like thinking about it is that I mean, in, in a world of multiple permission blockchains, I think what we end up losing is the interoperability aspect across multiple exchanges. And I think that's where that's where public block, blockchains can be useful because then you can have interoperability across multiple infrastructure providers and ma market participants. But as things stand now, as they look, we're not there yet with public blockchain. So you've got to work with what exists right now. Melton, do you want to respond to that? This, so I have another question, for, a similar question for you, because I, so by all means, respond to what should be just said, and then uh, I'll ask a quick kind of question on the evolution of all of this. Look, um, I don't think there is a right or a wrong answer here. At the end of the day, um, look, you, you have people who are working at legacy financial institutions. Um, I think it's really important. I'm going to go philosophical for a moment because I actually think it really matters. I think mental models and the way people view and experience the world is really important in how they also view and sort of understand digital currencies and digital assets. For a lot of people who operate in a regulated financial services environment, who have spent their careers in a banking environment, um, many of the ideas that are being experimented with and being sort of built in the digital currency space feel um, they see the opportunity, but the way in which it's being implemented is very much at odds with the mental model that's been built up over time. And a lot of, you have to remember, I was, I've been talking to the streets since 2015 about Bitcoin. I had to raise money for cryptocurrency, a Bitcoin-focused company. We said Bitcoin, we did not say blockchain. I had to raise money for a Bitcoin-focused company, Digital Currency Group, back in 2015. And nobody wanted to talk to us. They thought Bitcoin was for criminals. They thought Bitcoin was for crazy people. I mean, we had doors slammed in our face. Um, you know, the, the perception that a lot of people have of Bitcoin and digital currencies in particular just doesn't map very well into the mental model that people have after operating in, in the markets we have today, um, really at all. Um, the other point I want to make is, you know, uh, Repertus touched a little bit on uh, the digital transformation that's been happening within banks. What I think is really interesting, again, if we look back to what happened um, in the late 90s and early 2000s with the explosion of um, Web 2.0, right, the ability to really easily, really cheaply build um, websites and then iPhone apps by procuring services on demand. Um, financial services have not yet had their AWS moment, but I 100% am fully convinced that they will. It's not just going to be with blockchain technology or digital currencies. It's happening on a lot of different fronts. Um, I don't know if anyone caught this announcement, but just a few days ago, Plaid announced an integration with Microsoft Excel, where you can now effectively code financial functions into a spreadsheet. Like, talk about really fundamentally transformative. Um, but I think, again, there is this whole evolution that's coming where all of um, how we think about banks as a function, how we think about the regulatory um, sort of structure that is around certain financial intermediaries, that's going to start to evolve and really change. It is my belief that most financial services um, will be abstracted into software layers. At the end of the day, right, here's just an interesting mental concept. Um, I've been doing a week-long series that ends today about the future of capital markets, where each day we've taken a different component of the trade life cycle and talked to a technology entrepreneur who's building um, software that's basically going to abstract that layer. So basically what you have is you can now enable price discovery and trade execution as software, right? You um, simply, it's just a messaging board. It's like combining Bloomberg chat with a uh, messaging board, right? All you're doing is enabling people to talk to one another to facilitate price discovery. And then execution can happen bilaterally. It can happen on exchanges. It can happen dealer to dealer, however you like. But the regulation gets pushed to the counterparties. If you have some sort of standardized KYC AML process, by the way, where you can verify these parties are authorized to do business in the jurisdiction you're in, then you can also start to abstract that process into 
the software layer. The next step, the clearing layer, um, there's a company that's building a distributed clearinghouse where basically they're um, building a margin calculator um, that's built on zero knowledge proofs, meaning people, uh, you don't need to um, have information or a central clearinghouse like the OCC that has a standard contract. You can create any sort of bespoke contract, enter it into the calculator, and then allow people to cross margin. So all of a sudden you're creating efficiency of capital that has never existed before in markets because you're required to post collateral on the platform where you're trading, which is really capital inefficient today. So all of a sudden you're allowing for cross margining across any sort of, of crypto asset, any blockchain based asset. And then at the core layer, and this is where I think the real disruption happens at the settlement layer, all of a sudden you're seeing a bunch of new solutions being introduced on the custody side. And while there are a lot of people who may today only feel comfortable with a regulated custodian or a custodian that's being run by somebody they already trust and do business with, there's this big sort of range of options that are available to you, you can self-custody. You have multi-sig solutions for collaborative custody between a consortium of institutions, which starts to look more like a decentralized version of um, the DTCC. And so there are all of these different abstractions that you can now create at the settlement layer. You add in the feature of atomic swaps where you no longer have to do one party going first, or you no longer have to use an intermediary who escrows the funds. All of a sudden, what starts to happen, and again, it doesn't happen overnight. This is like the beginning of a very long arc. Um, but I do think what starts to happen is you start to enable more and more um, abstraction of things that have historically been done in a regulated um, institutional environment. You start to abstract that into software layers that enable all sorts of different market participants to participate A, but B, you also create more optionality because you no longer have to have a high degree of standardization. You can customize different features and attributes of these assets, but they can still clear, they can still settle um, using the settlement finality and the pro security promise of a, of a public blockchain like the Bitcoin blockchain. So I think, again, it, it sounds a little far-fetched, um, but as someone who's been living it for the last five years, and I was probably one of the biggest ICO skeptics after sort of this initial wave we saw in 2017, after living it, um, it doesn't take much to see where this is all going. And it's going to move slowly at first and then very quickly and all at once. And I think if you look at the way that Libra catalyzed central banks, right? Central banks didn't want anything to do with central bank issued digital currencies until Facebook laid out the four-dimensional chess game for them, that if they didn't do it, that private corporations were going to do it and effectively take power from central banks. Like, It doesn't take very many moves on the chessboard to see how these games play out. And I certainly think that in capital markets, we haven't seen real transformation yet. The real transformation will be when we start to see the um, abstraction of these different layers of the trade get broken out from this vertical stack that we're so accustomed to operating in. So, and I think so that the core that is really taking the assets and not requiring them to be posted on the venue where you're trading or at the bank where you're, you're doing business. That's transformative. Right. Great. Sorry, so, I get very excited. I don't know how many people no, get this fine. excited about clearing and settling. It really excites me. <laughs> very few, very few, but still, it's very interesting to see. Uh, but, but Rupert said, and Shubit, if I were you listening to this, I would be very worried, right? <laughs> because when Melton talks about abstraction, it means abstraction from your function. So, so Rupert, using your analogy of Netscape Navigator, how can you and other legacy uh, exchanges, infrastructure provider, make sure that you don't become Netscape Navigator, meaning you don't get uh, disrupted away from this industry? How can you be at the forefront of the changes that Melton uh, talks about? Look, we, 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 we have the beauty at SDX that SIX does the what you just described as legacy business for the last 120 years. We know how exchanges operate, we know how settlement and custody functions work, and we know how payments work because SIX does all the payments for the Swiss National Bank as well. So translating this enormous amount of history and experience into the new world is a long-lasting project. I mean, this is not a sprint what we built here. This is an ultra marathon, and we have an adoption time where we believe over the course of time our clients will identify which areas of the value chain are better than the legacy business and will be replaced. And others might never change because the way it works is perfect. So there will be a hybrid. There is not 
black or white. It will be both elements have their rights to stay and being changed. Um, you would ask the question, why does six do it? Well, if are we not becoming a competitor and a cannibalization factor of our own mother? And there's two answers to it. First of all, if we don't do it, someone else is going to come into the Swiss market and does it for us, because we have seen the crypto crypto kings from Far East Asia looking into the Swiss market, talking to the regulators, and moving your business from a B to C crypto space into a B to B to C, and eventually into B to B is not a big mess. It's not a big step, right? Uh, asking for a banking license takes time, takes money, takes a lot of legal work, but it's not impossible. So we had to react. Six had to react, and Six had was brave enough to say, "Guys, we do it ourselves. We want to shape the platform. We want to be at the forefront of financial market on DLT that will build." And if we cannibalize our business, we rather move it from the six wallet to the SDX wallet, rather moving from the six wallet to anybody else. That's easy. Now, it's on, on secondly, this is going to be a parallel run. All my clients tell me, now, if I connect to SDX, can I switch six off? No, you can't, because we're not going to wipe out the six business tomorrow. It's not that we are going to issue at First, Novartis shares, UBS shares, and Roche shares in tokenized format to have a competitive offer, classic business, new business. No, what we're going to start with is we're going to start with what we call native tokens. So security tokens, securities, which have not been listed on six before. So they are natively born in our in ecosystem. And either they are born out of our SDX system and regulatory framework, or they are not of interest for us. I receive dozens of requests on a daily basis. People from all over the world have issued their tokens, coins, on various uh, uh, chains and, 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 and protocols, and they want to, guess what? They all want to come to us because they're looking for a harbor and a melting pot where liquidity is concentrated, where transfer is, is, is guaranteed under a regulated umbrella. Guess what? I'm, you are happy. You can all come to SDX, but you guys, you have to respect our standardization framework. We are not allowing each and every chain protocol issue token on our platform. Either you become our standard or you're not in at the beginning. I fully agree what you said, Francesco. Interoper and as Shobit says, interoperability in the future will be key. We do not believe we will be the only ones, and we do not believe as much as we like it that R3 Coda will be the only protocol on the permission chain. We are going to open it up. We need to make sure that the interoperability between businesses and, and products will be achieved. But this is, again, we're talking a long, long project here. Now, finally, on the, on the currency, I fully agree with what Meltem said. Libra was a given for us. It was a given because suddenly our proof of concept, the idea we had in digitalizing the Swiss franc in order to make the atomic swap happening. So in how it works is UBS buys a token from Credit Suisse. So what happens is in the moment big enough for matches on our trading engine, the order book freezes. There is a check going down in the DLT. Does Credit Suisse really have the token they want to sell? Yes. Does UBS have the digital Swiss franc to pay for the transaction? Yes. Order matched, order executed, order settled, order cleared, everything going to go. That's how it works. Where do we get the digital Swiss franc from? Well, we are working with the Swiss National Bank since months in order to provide a digital Swiss franc for the atomic swap. Because if you break the end-to-end -end chain and trade the token digital, but then you do whatever fiat T plus something, it's imperfect. <laughs> That's not what we want to do. We want to have a perfect business here. So I want to get back the to... Digi... Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I was saying I want to go back to digital currency if we have time, but there's a couple of questions from the audience as well. So go ahead, sorry, finish your point, sir. Go ahead. Finish my point. So the digital Swiss franc works in form. Libra put the pressure on the central banks, everyone, SMB, ECB, the Chinese guys, the Fed, everybody's working on, on digital currency solutions. Do we want commercial, uh, do we want central bank money to be tokenized? <clears throat> that's the big question. Now, what we come up with is the first pro project, and that's what we're going to go live with, is it's not going to be central bank money, it's going to be commercial money. <clears throat> SDX 
once we got the license as to run the CSD, we will run an account with the Swiss National Bank. And every bank working with us owns a sub account on our account. So let's say BNP opens an account with, with SDX, they give us 100 Swiss francs. We give them 100 tokens. They can transact on SDX. We take the 100 Swissies and deposit it with the Swiss National Bank. That's kind of a stable coin. It's commercial money because SDX is the issuer of the, of, of the coin. In the second step, I would, of course, be in big hopes and good hopes that we can establish a project where SMB at themselves issue the, the digital Swiss francs, because then you don't have to have this process of tokenization and retokenization for the members, because they always need to know, depending on liquidity, flow, transactions, do I need to have coins in my portfolio, or is it okay if I have fiat in my portfolio? So this ongoing tokenization and retokenization of the currency can be avoided if the central bank says, yes, you know what, you can issue, we can issue Swiss francs ourselves, bank money. That would ease our model a hell of a lot. So I want to uh, conclude before we go to the audience quickly, uh, which should be, I mean, I don't want to ask you about digital currencies uh, issued by central banks, but I do want to ask you about this race. I think Rupertus described it as a marathon towards a digital future uh, that uh, Melton explained so eloquently. Where do banks, what do banks do? Wait and see, try to be at the forefront, somewhere in between. What, what, what's the strategy for, for the financial services provider? So, I mean, I, I, I agree both with Milton and Rupertus over here that it's not something that's going to be going to play out in the next uh, three to five years. It's more of a 10 to 20 year thing uh, than something in three to five years. Having said that, right, I mean, the way we think about it is that and, and partially agreeing with both, right, banking will be a will be a platform business where uh, which will enable variety of players to plug into the platforms. Now, that would that might mean that we don't own all parts of the value chain, uh, but that enables us to partner and work with fintechs and other innovative com companies in the space, which is what, I mean, we at City have been doing, right? I mean, we've been working with, uh, working either partnering with fintechs or working with them through our strategic investments in them to deploy their solutions uh, for our client. Uh, but I mean, but as, as I mean, one of the things specifically with blockchain is, I mean, what, 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 uh, what, what keeps me interested is market structure. How does the market structure evolve in light of these developments? You know, I mean, I mean, a lot of the, a, a big selling point of blockchain based assets has been, uh, instant settlement though. I mean, if you think of, about how, how uh, us and some of our peers in this space operate, right? We're big market makers and we deploy our balance sheets to provide liquidity to our clients and the markets as a whole. And we do through this through bilateral credit agreements. And we settle on a T plus one or a T plus two basis. What that enables is that, I mean, it enables doing away with the requirement of pre-funding every trade. Now, on th thinking of a world where you every trade is pre-funded will actually end up might end up sucking up liquidity from the market rather than actually adding to it. So it might have the perverse impact of what this actually is touted to do. Now it it helps to solve some of the counterparty risk issues. So, but then it will be a trade-off between counterparty risk and balance sheet efficiencies, right? Because because of T plus one, T plus two settlements, I mean all the market makers are able to deliver massive amounts of balance sheet efficiencies, which effectively puts in more liquidity in the market and which helps our, our clients as a whole. So uh, it's interesting right. that we have uh, a couple of questions uh, from the audience on market structure. So I, I wish you had more time to actually answer them all. But one is from Multi, uh, who uh, asks, uh, and uh, let me know who wants to take this one. But if you had to choose, what is the benefit incumbents should focus on when engaging to DLT solutions? Efficiency gains for operations or improved product distribution? So efficiency gains or improved product distributions? Maybe you'll start Rupert, who works for an incumbent. That is, the, no, 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 that, is, that, is, uh, that is the key of all questions. <laughs> and guess what? It, it, it differs, it differs um, tremendously of who you speak to. Um, I have been in banking for 25 years. 
Uh, I come from equity derivatives, trading, structuring, selling. I know how cumbersome and complex bookings, booking infrastructure services are. Um, creating a product, booking a tra product, transferring a product. I can imagine um, there are tremendous amounts of efficiency gains in operational levels in terms of asset servicing starts from uh, database synchronization. There's only one database. Either it's in our chain or it doesn't exist. You don't have to synchronize 15 different databases. Either it sits on our chain or it doesn't exist. Um, asset servicing, dividend payments, coupon payments, redemptions, issuance process, prospectuses, automation, shelf space with smart contracts attached to the various products. I can imagine there is an awful lot of ops efficiency in the market possible using the new technology as Melton described it. On the other side, adding new asset classes to the product line. A bond is a bond. For, a, for the end investor, it doesn't feel different if he has a bond token in his portfolio or a bond classic security style. It's the same thing. He has an investment uh, horizon and he has a risk uh, uh, feeling. And what the real format of the product is probably irrelevant for him. But asset classes which are yet not bankable, tokenized commodity, uh, tokenized commodities, tokenized uh, commercial property, uh, trade finance, patent rights, uh, the obvious art collectors. I mean, there are hundreds of different areas which can be made bankable where they are currently not. And that is a direct revenue driver for the banks offering their service. So it's both. Mm -hmm. It's both. Yes. Melton, do you think? Is there one that should be take precedence over the other? Nope. Um, I think everyone has has different priorities. Um, what I've always focused on, you know, I think one is what does the end customer want, and the second is what are we trying to optimize for. There's really only two levers you can pull. Distribution is about increasing top line, that's money coming in the door, and then cutting costs is about um, the second lever, which is increasing the bottom line by cutting costs, right? So taking less out of the top line. There's really only two, two levers. If figure out which one you want to pull. In, both, in most cases, people want to pull both, right? We want it all. Um, but I think in a lot of instances, what we see at banks, you know, 30 to 40 percent of bank um, costs are compliance, right? There's a lot of sort of compliance and manual processing and error corrections and I just think about our internal compliance and audit needs as a as a firm in, in our space. It's tremendous. And so I think that's one of the biggest cost areas that people are going to look to cut, um, things that are really core to the business but aren't necessarily value drivers in terms of uh, revenue generation capability or revenue maximization capability. Mm -hmm. And should be, um, from your perspective, from, from a bank's perspective, uh, is it what Melton was saying, operation... No, I mean, I think I agree both with both Milton and Rupertus over here, and it's both, and it, it really depends on the time horizon. I think specific to blockchain, in the short term, it is efficiency gains, and in the long term, I mean, as I said, right, I mean, uh, I mean, we believe banking would be a platform business, right, which essentially helps with distribution. I mean, if you think of what we have at City, I mean, at City, our, we have a content distribution called Velocity, and we have about close to 100,000 institutional investors on it. And we distribute all our research uh, research and data content through Velocity. So we are already doing it in, in some of our product areas. In other product areas, uh, in other product areas, there's a cost cost benefit analysis to be done in terms of what are, are even the do even clients want to consume the product in a certain way, right? Are the clients ready? Are the clients have the clients upgrade? Uh, ready with their IT systems to consume products via API. So we have to think we, we have to think about what our clients for ready are ready for. In certain aspects where they're ready, we can do that. But we're not, right? We have we work towards that path. Great. Well unfortunately with that we are we are out of time. Uh, first of all I would like to thank the, the panelists, Shubit Melton and Rupertus. They gave us fantastic uh, insights into so many aspects of it, even beyond ICOs, which was our original topic. I learned a lot. I hope the audience learned a lot. I would like to uh, thank the audience uh, for being with us and asking very good questions. Uh, and a reminder that this is a the first of four seminars, webinars that uh, Financial News will host alongside a partner, Six Exchange. So 
look out for the next uh, three on the future uh, capital uh, markets. Uh, and with that, I remind you that this will also be available on demand if you want to watch it or tell other uh, people uh, to watch it. And with that, I thank you very much. I thank the audience. If we were doing this live, we'll give them a, a round of applause. So let's give them a virtual uh, round of applause. And also thank, uh, thank you all for making you feel us a little more connected in times that are not exactly uh, ideal. As you can see, we had a great discussion from very different countries, uh, and we were able to do that and feel connected with the audience. So we're very grateful for that as well. Thanks again, and see you soon. Thank you.